And the answer is absolutely yes. There is no doubt in my mind that by the year 2100, all of the world will be run on renewable resources. That means basically solar energy, solar power and solar heat and uh, some windmills and some biomass and some hydro. You know, we will have a completely fossil free world by the year 2100. A more interesting question is how quickly will this come? And in my book, I expect 40% of the energy supply to be uh, renewable by 2050. So that still in 2050, 60% will come from fossils, uh, but we will have made a huge shift in the right direction. And the reason why I'm very certain about this is that we already know the technologies. We already know that there is more than enough solar energy to run the world 10,000 times over, you know, every day. Uh, And uh, the only reason why this is not implemented large scale is that it's slightly more expensive than fossil energy at this time. For gasoline, the only direct substitutes are biofuels like ethanol and biodiesel. Unfortunately, they're not very good substitutes because to produce large quantities of these fuels requires farmland and implies more destruction of topsoil and use of fertilizers and so on, at least the way we we do agriculture now. So uh, realistically, those are, are, are not going to be very useful substitutes in, in the years ahead. There's also, of course, the possibility of running vehicles on uh, natural gas. That's not a very good substitute since natural gas is also depleting fossil fuel and burning it still releases CO2. Then there's the possibility of electric vehicles. And there again, it's not a particularly good substitute. We need much better battery technology in order to store enough uh, electricity to have you know, decent range on vehicles. Uh, certainly not, we're never going to have batteries that will power airplanes like airliners with you know, hundreds of passengers like we do now. So the best solution to our transport situation is going to be finding ways to do less of it. Yes, at the margins, we can substitute fuels, uh, but we're not going to be able to find substitutes, I don't think, that will enable us to maintain the scale of transport that we have today. So we're looking at a less mobile future. We can plan for that. How do we how do we organize our economy to deal with less travel and, and transport? This is a problem that can be solved. We, after all, uh, 50 or 100 years ago, we were much less mobile. We had much less international trade and so on, and, and yet everyone got by. The problem, of course, is that we have created expectations of uh, high mobility uh, not only in the general populace who like to take vacations and you know fly from continent to continent for ecotourism and so on, but also for long distance trade of commodities like food. So we can adjust to a less mobile society. After all, we, we had a much less mobile society 50 or 100 years ago, but uh, the transition is, is the trick. We have to plan for, for less mobility, relocalize uh, a lot of production. Uh, and, uh, and if we do that, then I, I think we, we can make the adjustment. But if we just hung up on finding direct substitutes for gasoline and jet fuel, I think we'll, we'll probably not be very successful. Yes to both questions. Cars, scooters and buses can run on batteries. This would be viable if coupled with an infrastructure of charging spots and switch stations where one could swap within one minute the battery, get a fresh one and ride off. Trains can be electrified. Ships can run on compressed methane, derived from biogas, which in turn is derived from excreta. Smaller boats can also run on compressed hydrogen, which is generated via water electrolysis. Larger boats can also run on micro-nuclear reactors. Uh, As far as power. A scheme that I modeled in great detail depends on a vast grid of superconducting cables, linking solar and wind resources with the population centers. Under this scheme, solar power towers are the backbone. 
where the molten salt can generate power at any time of the day and night. PV solar farms generate most of the power during the day. Wind, albeit erratic, trim much of the land footprint of those installations. Hydrogen would be stored in our depleted natural gas and salt caverns and is brought back up when the wind and solar powers are running low. There is a lot more to be said, but this is it in a nutshell. And yes, the industrial bases used to manufacture all of the above can be electrified as well, or in some cases, as last resort, we can use uh, biofuel, biogas, or hydrogen as sources of power. Bottom line, we can make do without fossil fuel entirely. There's certainly a great wish out there that we could or might be able to run all of the stuff that we're running by other means. And in fact, uh, I think it's safe to say that that wish is at the heart of a lot of the techno grandiose thinking that is now uh, that now passes for you know mainstream intellectual activity. But uh, I do think that it is wishful. I'm serenely convinced that we're going to be disappointed by what alternative energy can do for us. I'm quite sure that we're not going to run the happy motoring system uh, by other means. That, uh, in fact, the automobile it will soon be a diminished presence in our lives. An awful lot of people think that the whole motoring system depends on uh, whether or not you can get fuel. But we're going to discover that it's not about just the fuel. It's about whether people can get loans to buy the hardware to do the motoring. Because that's how many people in the world, especially in America, are used to getting cars. They get loans to buy them. And since we're entering a period of uh, capital scarcities, I think that that's going to be a big issue. Fewer and fewer people are going to be able to buy new cars. And eventually, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of people driving older used cars. And then eventually there won't be any good used cars left. And eventually you know, the whole system is going to uh, be very challenged. The electric grid is probably, my guess is, probably hopeless. Um, right now it's uh, decrepit. It's a patchwork of uh, workarounds and uh, bailing wire and duct tape, and we do manage to keep it running. But uh, my guess is is that uh, you know the aging process is on an accelerating arc, and uh, that we're going to see uh, more problems and more frequent problems of a larger uh, order of magnitude with the electric grid. You know, they just had the, the big outage in India the other day where over 650 million people were blacked out. And people were asking me about that today in uh, some other podcast. And it, uh, it's so amusing, really, to think that India would imagine that, that having an electric grid would be a permanent part of uh, their story. You know, they were only electrified, you know, within the last hundred years. And... Um, uh, if, if our electric system is held together with duct tape and bailing wire, their electrical system is held together with uh, little colored paper twisty ties. So the idea that, that people in, uh, you know, in places like that are going to continue to enjoy massive amenities like uh, you know, electric service for a, million, for a billion people, I think is laughable. And um, in fact, I, my pet theory about Japan that Japan is now so uh, uh, disabled uh, in the collective psychological sense that the, the industrial experience for them has been such a fiasco that they're actually going to opt to return to medieval living. And I think we'll see that in the next uh, you know, 20 years or so. They will make a conscious decision to go back to that wonderful uh, 16th century culture of you know, beautiful uh, uh, made objects and artistry and uh, samurais and the wind in the rice fields. Well, there are definitely substitutions for gasoline, but all of those substitutions will have their own set of side effects and consequences. And we could potentially, you know, have uh, things like electric cars. But if we take a step back and look at the whole life cycle of an electric car, we find out, at least according to a study that was done by the National Academy of Sciences, that the entire life cycle, uh, there's really no benefit to an electric car once you take everything into account. And so this is why 
I argue that electric cars end up uh, becoming a green illusion. And I think that's the problem with a lot of new transportation technologies, that they can look very alluring in the beginning, but then when you start to find out the total cost, uh, cost of manufacturing, cost of uh, providing the fuel, whatever it is, whether it's a fossil fuel or nuclear fuel or or something else, you find out that there's actually a whole other set of side effects and limitations that you weren't looking for in the first place because we're so accustomed to looking for fossil fuel consumption, we're so accustomed to looking at exhaust and emissions, uh, and these new vehicle technologies have a different set of side effects and a different set of limitations that we're not used to looking for.